coming up here and we are live on the air i am hank strange welcome back this is live from the big daddy gun studio this is the who moves my freedom podcast today our special guest you can see him right here he is luis valdez he's running for nra board of directors 2018 so we're going to find out who is Luis Valdez? That's what we're going to find out right now. Who is he? I'm going to talk to him, find out why is he running for the board of directors. We're going to talk about the NRA a little bit. You know, we can't, we can't not talk about the NRA here. And uh, also, we're going to talk about some current events. So what's up, Luis? Hey, what's up, Hank? Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, uh, I'm glad you came. I think we met at NRA, right? This past NRA? That we did. Uh I, if I recall, you were at the Henry booth filming their new uh, threaded lever actions that could be suppressed. Oh, okay. Oh. And I was like, and I, and I remember I went up to you, I was like, hey, we both have Daewoo's. Yeah. Oh, you have a Daewoo. Yeah, that's, you know what, man? I forgot about all that. I just remember meeting you at NRA. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a blur. I understand that. I know somewhere at the NRA we met. I'm not even sure what booth, but that's cool. So you've got a day. How long have you had yours? Uh, I've had it now for about four years. I actually bought it brand new. It was old stock sitting in a gun shop, and they knew they know I like old stuff. And it was like, hey, you like rare 80s oddball stuff? And they whipped out the day. And, yeah. of course, my wallet couldn't go fast enough for my pocket. Exactly. I would buy another one right now if I could. So I would go. love to get another one. I would love yeah. to get the modernized one. Yeah. Uh, have, has that become available here in the States yet? No, not yet. Uh, but um, it could very well be available in the States if uh, certain legislation passes in Congress. Yeah. Yeah. I know Lionheart's been working on bringing it through, but there's a lot of things that stand in the way of that. That there so. is. So very cool. So, all right. So we're here to talk about you running for uh, 2018 board of directors for the NRA. Um, you know, do you want to like give us a little bio? Tell us who you are for folks out there who've never heard of you. Well, I bet you a lot of folks haven't heard of me because for most of this, I've been quiet and under the radar and I wanted to keep it that way. But as a gun owner and as a Floridian and as an NRA member, enough's enough. Right. To give a quick background, I've been an NRA member since 1994. I've okay. been a cop for the last 10 years. I'm still actively a cop. And I burned my own personal vacation time to lobby at uh, my state capitol and also when I could go to D.C. to lobby there for better gun laws. Um, I'm running for the board of directors for the NRA because I think the NRA needs new blood, needs more aggressive members that really want to tackle the current issues that are facing gun owners all across the country. And I just don't mean on the simple things of, hey, let's pass the Hearing Protection Act so we could get suppressors deregulated. I mean on a civil rights level. The Second Amendment is the last civil rights battle for the 21st century. And literally, gun control laws can be traced back to Jim Crow era laws, to race laws. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. That's where a lot of those came in if uh, i mean i can't remember were there any before that there were but it was all designed to keep minorities disarmed mm -hmm. uh, even before the united states was a country you had colonial laws that stripped freed black men from owning muskets because they didn't want them to go around and arm slaves so of course they passed laws in the colonies and both when it was british and if you go further west, when Louisiana and all of that territory was either part of the Spanish Empire or the French Empire, they had laws on the books that disarmed black people, that disarmed natives, that disarmed women. They All gun laws could be traced back to bigotry and racism. Right. Mm -hmm. And currently, right now, the laws we have on the books, like in New York, you have the Sullivan Law, which was passed in 1911. That law was passed by the Irish political machine to disarm the recently arriving Italians because they saw them as a threat to their criminal empire. So, so what, what exactly is the Sullivan Law? The Sullivan Law in New York is the permitting system that's in place right now to this day, where if you're a resident in the state of New York, you have to apply for a permit. It's May issue. It's not a shell issue permit, which means... Okay. You could be a complete law-abiding citizen. They could go up to you and say, nope, we don't like you. We're not going to give you a handgun permit. Have a nice day. 
Right. Okay. And it, it's a tool used to control the ownership of firearms. And in New York, if you're not politically connected, especially if you're a New Yorker living in New York City, you're not going right. to get a handgun for self-defense. In California, for example, the uh, open carry ban and the waiting period was passed in 1967 to disarm black people that were protesting at the state capitol. Now, it was the Black Panthers that were protesting, and are they a bit radical? Yes, I'm not denying that, but they were a civil rights group that viewed that they were being infringed upon and they were exercising their Second Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the Second Amendment, I don't look at it on a political party side, Republican versus Democrat. I look at it as a civil rights matter. As a cop and as a prior soldier, I took an oath to defend the Constitution. And I will defend the Constitution and those liberties and rights for everyone. If right. you are white, black, Hispanic, gay, straight, I don't care. I will defend it for everyone. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, um, hold on one second here. I just want to uh, just want to check into something. What's going on? Okay. Yeah. Just want to make sure that our video is going live out there. Okay. I think it should be it should be live now. Let's. Uh, I, I wasn't a hundred percent sure that the video may have been not going live. Let's see. Technical difficulties. Okay, it should be should be good right now. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'm sorry. So yeah, we, you know, we, the conversation that we were having is that a lot of these laws are de like designed to keep specific people from getting their hands on guns. I mean, that was the original intention. I think now it just keeps it just keeps everyone, and people are using those laws to basically keep most people. You know, not just oh. people of color. From, from oh, getting their hands it, and guns, right? Exactly. These mm -hmm. these were laws that were originally implemented mostly for race reasons. They were used to keep minorities disarmed. But now the current political class has really utilized it just to keep everyone disarmed. Because since we're moving as a society into a post-racial society, and I know even with the current Black Lives Matter issues and mm -hmm. uh, perceived injustices amongst law enforcement and certain minority communities, we are still moving into a post-racial society when it comes to civil rights matters. Because right. that was the whole goal of the civil rights movement. And now they're using those laws just to restrict everyone. Absolutely. You know, and, th and that's the thing I think people that don't understand about this situation that you know, in the in the beginning, you know, we're living in a completely different world from you know, um, you know, a hundred years ago. Abs you know, without a doubt, we're living in a different world, and people don't understand that the things that might that might seem like rational and okay back then, you know, today, they're they're really you know they're they're really just not making any kind of sense at all to us, but they're still being used against us. I guess that's the way I, I, I want to put it. You know, that's what I'm searching for here. Oh, I, I completely understand You know, you're bringing back prior time periods mm -hmm. on my personal, on a personal level for me, I'm in a mixed race, I'm in a mixed race marriage. My wife is right. black. Okay. Prior to the Supreme court case, loving v versus Virginia, it would have been illegal for me to marry my wife. And that was, 60 that was 50 years ago that was 1967 yeah it's 50 years ago but yeah we have people alive today yeah middle-aged people if you were yeah. born in 1967 you're middle-aged you're middle-aged but we have yeah. people that are still alive today that they clearly remember the 50s they remember the right. 40s and they're like yeah i remember when that happened yeah. and we are still in that type of situation when it comes to the second amendment and self-defense rights it's in a number of localities, both in states, territories, and cities. It's right. It's not just centered on the usual places where people think, oh, New York, and oh, California. It's even happening in Puerto Rico. It's happening in Guam. It's happening in Washington, D.C. It's happening all across the country where you have local government, state-level government, and, of course, you have individuals in the federal government that still want to restrict those rights. 
Yeah, and and the thing that I that I think that people a lot of people think, listen, you know, the NRA and even pro Second Amendment gun guys, what we're about is stopping, you know, new laws from going to effect. I think that's part of what we're doing. We're trying to stop new um, negative laws or you know anti gun laws from going into effect. But we also want to get rid of a lot of crap that's been in there for a long time or clean, you know, or, or bring some of the, you know, bring things up to the, the current, you know, day and times that we're living in. Oh, I completely agree. That's why I'm running for the board of directors. I think that the NRA as the 800 pound gorilla really needs to get loose from its cage and go on the offensive and really fight for better gun laws. And when I mean better gun laws, I mean repealing half of the stupid stuff that's on the books now and pushing for true liberalization of self-defense laws in right. i mean in new jersey and new orleans you just had two court cases that said hey the second amendment applies to tasers you can now carry a taser but in new jersey as you know it's practically a no issue state no one could really get a concealed carry permit in new jersey and sadly i can't remember the exact date but i believe it was last year there was an incident where a woman applied for her handgun permit because she had a violent ex that was stalking her and she would go to the police station to get it to check on the status of it, and they would keep telling her nope not yet it's still in the process and what happened was is she was killed in her driveway okay and when people bring up things like oh waiting periods you know they keep crimes of passion from occurring yeah I want to flip that crimes of passion. Okay. What about the crazy ex that killed this poor woman that was begging the state for a handgun permit and the state denied her because they were literally dragging it through the mud as long as they can. Isn't that it? You know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's a limit. That's stopping someone from being able to defend themselves against a crime of passion. Right? Exactly. You, you know, know. So, I mean, that that's completely getting in the way. I understand they think, well, someone's just going to decide right now that they want to do something destructive and get their hands on a gun and go out there and do that. Well, what would stop them from doing that with knives, with a car, you know, with baseball bat, all the other things that exist out there? Exactly. Crimes of legitimate crimes of passion is with anything that's within reach. I could use this water bottle in right. a crime of passion if I want. Right. But – to restrict someone that has a proven need for self-defense and to have them rely on the state is it's horrible it's wrong and on top of that it's unconstitutional the supreme court said hey look law enforcement they don't have a duty to protect you the individual they only have a duty to protect society as a whole so if you don't get saved sorry it's not our fault hey they tried right. and that's not right you know, the state, and when I mean the state, I mean the government as a whole, the government is stepping in and they're restricting people from defending themselves. When last I checked, the whole principle of Americanism is independence and self-reliance. Absolutely. I and mean, we were talking about that earlier today with, uh, you know, with this incident that we had uh, with Congress in uh, Virginia. And uh, then there was another incident uh, at UPS, I believe, in San Francisco. Uh, yes. Lola is actually at the door, and she's locked out. So I'm going to let you talk about that. This is how we can prove that this is going out live. You talk about that real quick. I will be right back after I let Lola in before I get in trouble. <laughs> Go ahead. Not a problem. Involving Alexandria, Virginia, and the attack on the uh, Republican congressman, the whole issue with that in the Second Amendment is this. You have a number of individuals that, by law, if they were on the other side of the river in Washington, D.C., they wouldn't be able to carry for self-defense. Now, luckily, the speaker, the, um, the majority whip, he had his protective detail, which was two Capitol Police officers. That's fantastic. As a law enforcement officer, hey, I'm proud for my brothers in blue for stepping up to the plate and taking the fight to the bad guy. But if he wasn't there, the other congressmen like uh, – Rep uh, Representative Jeff, uh, I'm all tongue tied here right now. Representative Jeff Duncan, who of course was one of the sponsors and authors of the Hearing Protection Act, he could have been targeted. Uh, Senator Rand Paul, he was there, he could have been targeted. There could have been a number of people that could have been targeted. And by law, 
if they were on the other side of the river, they couldn't have a gun. Now, because since they're congressmen, they go back and forth between Alexandria, Virginia and Washington, D.C., you know, they're not going to disarm and arm and disarm and arm. So they follow the law. They keep their guns oh, at home when they cross the river and they were victims. And that right there is a problem. We should have national reciprocity when it comes to self-defense. An imaginary line on a map shouldn't stop me as an individual from being able to carry a firearm in self-defense if I want to cross into Georgia, if I want to drive to New York, or if I want to go to Puerto Rico, or if I want to go to California. It shouldn't stop me. And worse is, as a law enforcement officer, I'm covered under the Law Enforcement Officer Safety Act, which allows me to carry nationwide. But it doesn't let my wife carry. That's not right. What if she wants to visit family in New Jersey? She can't carry and defend herself, but I can because I carry a piece of tin in my wallet, which, hey, it's cool and all that I'm a cop, but the Second Amendment applies to all of us equally. Right, absolutely. And I think on that note, I don't know if you mentioned it and I missed it, but I think there were some senators that were, that were calling for a national reciprocity, but for congressmen. Correct. Um, it was Representative Barry Laudermilk. I believe he's out of Georgia. Uh, mm. According to the Washington Examiner today, he stated that there should be a national reciprocity bill. And let me pull it up real quick just to quote him. To quote the article, under Representative Barry Laudermilk's proposal, members who are allowed to carry concealed weapons in their home states would be allowed to in Washington. Laudermilk, a Republican of Georgia, said the problem is that the nation's capital does not recognize concealed carry licenses from other states. There are several things to look at, Laudermilk said. First of all, if this has happened in Georgia, he wouldn't have gotten too far. I have a staff member who was in the car, maybe 20 yards behind the shooter, who back in Georgia carries a 9mm in his car. I carry a weapon. He had a clear shot at him. But here, we're not allowed to carry any weapons here. Most of us are here in D.C., so how are we supposed to have it here? I think we need to look at some kind of reciprocity for members here, Laudermilk said. But also, we need to look at a security detail. If it hadn't been on our team, it would have been really bad. Now, I understand where he's getting at, but once again, the Second Amendment applies to us all. Just because you're an elected member of office or you're a law enforcement member or you're a member of the United States Armed Forces, you shouldn't be granted special rights and privileges. Yes, I understand there's, there are special rights and privileges that go with each position. Right. They already have those. They already have a lot of those. Yeah, they already have those. But when it comes to something as simple as being able to carry your own personal firearms for self-defense in our nation's capital, you know, the same city where in the National Archives they have the original Constitution on display and it has the Second Amendment clearly written out, you can't carry there. And here you have an elected member of Congress that is saying, hey, let's pass reciprocity, but only for us. That does send a bad message. And I think especially for the Republican Party because they – campaign as the party that is pro second amendment pro civil rights and yet here you have one of their members and i'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt because you know it was an emotional day he was possibly targeted in a terrorist uh, domestic terrorist and assassination attack so right. yeah i can understand his his emotions are running high right now but i think he needs to sit back and he needs to think about it and he goes you know what we should apply this to everyone. Well, yeah, you know, I think uh, there's two things here. One, I think that a lot of people are wondering why we have, you know, all these Republicans. I know I was wondering that out loud earlier. Why we have all these Republicans, they're supposed to be pro-gun, but they're not armed out there because if they really believe it, if they're really walking the walk, you know, or, or walking what they talk, then they they should have been armed out there and, and been able to fight back. Why weren't they? And obviously, you know, it's because there's these laws there. And if they realize these laws are there, they should have been doing something about this a long time ago instead of waiting. And then when you realize, so if something tragic happens to you, that's terrible, and you realize that you need it, you're there to serve us, and you should realize that we all need it. I 100% agree with that. And to, just to reiterate, there is a bill right now in Congress to push for national reciprocity for everyone. And I think this really needs to be brought to the forefront. And I know a lot of gun owners are really wanting the Hearing Protection Act. I want it too. 
Trust me, right. I would love for the NFA Act to just outright be abolished. But when it comes to the issue of civil rights, I think national reciprocity really needs to be pushed on the forefront. And it even needs to be pushed to where it's just constitutional carry. Because the act of asking for a piece of paper from government to defend yourself still is wrong. Look, we don't have poll taxes anymore where if you wanted to go vote, you had to pay a tax or you had to take a test. That was ruled unconstitutional. Why are we still having an archaic system when it comes to self-defense? Right now, we have 13 states that have constitutional carry, and it's wonderful. Basically, it says, look, if you're a law-abiding citizen and you are not a convicted felon and you have your rights and you're able to exercise them, go right ahead. Carry openly or concealed. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I think I agree with you on that. There, There's... um. You know, there's no reason, but except that for we're we're holding on to old things, you know, and I think we really need to like start changing. Uh, obviously, you've got people on the other side that want to change things for their own reason and go in a completely opposite direction. You know, oh, and, and this, this is a fight for the future, basically, of what we're facing here, you know, and I think without a doubt, I mean, when you have these, you know, I think this is a wake up call for people who thought that. They had these senators and congressmen and everyone was automatically protected and this kind of thing couldn't happen. And, you know, this kind of stuff already happened with Gabby Gifford. So there's got to be, you know, protocols and security in place, even though, the, you know, there were some uh, congressmen there that weren't high level that you've got a whole bunch of congressmen meeting at the same place to to uh, to practice uh, baseball. And then you're saying that if like. If there wasn't this high member there, high ranking member, you wouldn't have these two police officers who I believe it was either one or both of them were injured, right? If I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but for sure I know one was injured, two both might have possibly been injured. Yeah. I don't know if I don't know their their condition, but I last I heard it wasn't critical that it was both it was stable for at least one of the officers. I think one of the injuries was a uh, one of them was shot in the foot, which, right. hey, you know, for being shot in the foot and staying in the fight, once again, to my brothers and sisters wearing the badge, I'm proud of you guys. Keep up the fight. Yeah. So, I mean, but we, we, they, uh, they got pretty lucky there that no one's dead except the uh, guy that perpetrated this. He's, um, you know, the reports are saying that that guy's dead. And, um, and obviously this was something, I, I spoke about this earlier, this is something incited, I think. Th this is what you've had celebrities calling for. You've even had some politicians calling for people to rebel and strike back against the government because they're not happy with who's in government right now. They were perfectly happy, you know, a year ago, but now they're not happy. But if, if you didn't have these two police officers there, this would be a worse scenario. Or what if there was more than one guy? Exactly. And what if the cops weren't there? But let's even let, let's shift it. What if it was just a normal baseball game? What if it was like a you know a family outing and they're at a at a field and it's a little league game? You're not going to have the cops there because the people there are just common citizens. They're just normal everyday Americans. Yeah. So, in regards to the senators and them having protective details, I understand the logistical nightmare it would be because you have 635 members of Congress. You have, um, you know, the House and the Senate all together. So out of that, you have to have enough guys that could cover each member of Congress, sick days, vacation days, shift swaps, you know, all of that. So right. you're talking about a tremendous logistical nightmare. But right. let's not even look at that. Let's just look at this from the simple uh, civil rights issue. Once again, what if it was, you know, John Q. Citizen and his wife, and they're at a Little League game watching their kid practice, and or it's, you know, it's a soccer match, or it's a dance recital, or it's a shopping mall. And they can't defend themselves. There's been numerous instances where armed people have fought back against violent atta attackers, uh, where either it's been off-duty cops. And I know some agencies in the past, they restricted their cops from carrying off-duty. And it's also just been, you know, regular concealed carry permit holders yeah. or open carry holders or just, you know, regular people, even folks in their homes that have fought back. One of the best historical instances that a lot of people don't really understand is the Battle of Athens, Tennessee. 
after World War II, you had returning vets coming home from the war, and they were tired of, you know, the good old boy corruption. So they ran for – a couple of the vets ran for office. They were running for sheriff in some of the local seats. Right. And during the election, the sheriff rigged it and stuffed the ballot boxes and actually assaulted one of the voters who was a black uh, resident of the town. And these GIs said, enough's enough. They went home and they grabbed their privately owned arms and they went to the uh, county jail and they demanded that the sheriff, the corrupt sheriff, turn over the ballot boxes and they hold a legitimate election. And it happened. And that's what the Second Amendment was put in place for. It wasn't put in place for this violent attack where you saw, you know, some nut job go after elected members practicing for baseball. It was put in place to stop corruption. With the, it's called the Battle of Athens, Tennessee, but in reality, it wasn't a battle. It was a protest, and it was a legitimate protest against corruption, and there wasn't anger used. There wasn't you know, people randomly targeting and killing. It was a legitimate protest. These were veterans that came back from fighting for freedom and liberty in Europe and the Pacific, and then they came home and like, wait, wait, we we got corruption going on here. <laughs> no. Enough of this. So yeah, I mean, they, they did what the common mythos of the American patriot is. It's the everyday man rose up to the plate and said, "Enough's enough." If yeah, this is. I th I think I like your point there, and I mean, and that's the thing that I like about you. This is what freedom is about, and. You know, you're absolutely right. It's not that these guys should have a special privileges. This is just like in the healthcare thing, right? You know, if um, if they had to have the kind of healthcare system that we have, then they would probably change something. Oh, guaranteed. I mean, if Congress actually had to abide by the healthcare that the general public has, oh, are you kidding me? They'd stop that in 30 seconds. But right. they don't. Absolutely. So they get a special exemption because right. they carve themselves out one. And I know we're kind of we're we're jumping around, but back to the NRA. Uh, I think the main issue that the NRA has is it has a lot of it just has an older mindset where no, we shouldn't tackle certain issues. Recently, uh, of I bet you know, of course, Co uh, Colin Noir, great yeah. guy. Speak, you know, he's a great voice for the NRA. When Kim Kardashian was doing this whole "Hey, we're orange for gun control." He put out a video uh, basically saying, look, Kim, you kind of would qualify as one of the prohibited people under the Gun Control Act because you're kind of narcissistic and you possibly have admitted that you smoke marijuana and you use narcotics and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And the NRA pulled the video down. Now, the NRA pulled it down for probably a number of reasons. One, they didn't want to get sued by Kim Kardashian and her legal staff. But as a mindset. That's surprising. I think the NRA just needs to step up to the plate and say, right. look, we're the 800-pound gorilla. Let's act like it. I'm just one guy running for the board. There's 76 total members. Uh, there's a couple of other guys that are running for the board. A uh, great guy is Adam Kraut. He ran last year. He was this close to winning. Right. I, I voted for him at the uh, convention. As, as did I. I, I right. voted for him for the general election. Sadly, he'd lost, so he ran for the 76 seat for the board. And he was under a hundred votes to get for that seat. Wow. And I mean, he's a fantastic guy. He is one hell of a second amendment attorney out of uh, Pennsylvania. And he's, you know, he's like us. He wants the hearing protection act passed. He wants national reciprocity passed. Right. And he's, he's just not, you know, he's another guy. Yeah. I mean, but that's, I think that's why we we have you here, you know, why we really need to, uh, um, to, to dig into this whole thing. You know, we need to do more because if we came, if we came a hundred votes close, you know, close to getting that thing next time around, we need to do more work. We need to get, make sure that you guys get out there, but that we also cover it and we talk to people and we get everyone that's coming to the NRA show because that's one of the places you can vote. And then there's other places, obviously, which I'm going to ask you to get into. We need to make sure that we really push it because we were really that close. We were. The The way the election process works is right now I'm running by petition. I have to get 653 uh, valid NRA members to sign my petition. And to be a valid member, you either have to be a member in five years or more in good standing, or you have to be a lifetime member that has okay. the actual lifetime uh, program paid off. 
So on the so so a few questions here. Where is that petition? That petition right now is on my website. Sadly, it's buried on my website, and I promise you, by the end of this podcast, I will have it on the front part of my website. Okay, so I'm going to go look for that while we're talking about that here, and you know, make sure it's, that we we put it's that right into- now. It's right now on my weekly post dated May 30th. Okay, uh, website, website. Uh, what is your website? It's Lou, the number four, NRA.org. So L O U, number four, NRA.org. Okay, let's see. I'm going to um, search that. Yeah, so if anyone out there wants to know about this, you can just uh, let's let's see. So if you go to my website, I also have uh, some of the linked videos from this past legislative yeah. session at the Florida Capitol when I was uh, campaigning for better gun laws. Um, and you know, you were bringing up the Republican Party mm-hmm. in Florida. We've had a Republican supermajority for the last twenty years, and I'm not going to completely denounce the party, but they've kind of been dropping the ball. Uh, For the last couple of years, we've actually, here in Florida, we've had Republican members of our legislative body block pro-gun bills. Uh, This year, it was Anna Terry Flores. She publicly stated that she will not support any pro-gun bill, and she kept her word, and she was then became one of the new best friends of Moms Demand Action, Bloomberg's anti-gun organization. Uh, last year and the year before, it was Senator uh, De La Portia. He blocked open carry and campus carry. Uh, back in 2011, it was uh, Eileen uh, Bogendorf. We were literally about to get open carry in Florida, and at the last minute, by amendment, she gutted the bill. Right. Which this that's is the insane. This, that's insane. But this is the worst thing with it. In 2012, a gentleman by the name of uh, Dale Lee Norman, a Floridian in Fort Pierce, Florida, had his, you know, he was a lawful concealed carry permit holder. He was walking down the sidewalk and his t-shirt rode over his uh, holster. He was forced to the ground by three Fort Pierce cops at gunpoint and arrested for open carry. And this is where it gets horrible. In 2011, when Senator Bogendorf gutted the bill, she put this little provision in it that said, brief and accidental exposure is not a violation of the law. Well, tell Mr. Norman that when he was forced onto the concrete at gunpoint and had a knee on his back while he was being handcuffed, that it was brief and accidental and it didn't violate the law. Right. Yeah. Um, the, none of those things help you in the moment when you're... <laughs> No, clear, clearly not, because there was yeah, no legal definition situation. of what right. brief and accidental is. Uh, it just went to our state Supreme Court, and it was shot down. There's a, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the legal term right now, I believe it's called a 10 circuit split, where hopefully this will go to the federal Supreme Court. But at the present moment in Florida, we're, the only option we have is through the legislative process of, pairing, of passing open carrying and campus carry uh, by our uh, House of Representatives and our Senate. But mm-hmm. with Senator Flores this year, when the Pulse nightclub terrorist attack happened, she was the only Republican in the state to side with Democrats to call for a special legislative session for gun control. And that was back on June 28th. On July 5th, she sent a personal letter to the current NRA representative in Florida, Miss Marion Hammer, who she's done a fantastic job here over the years. She got us shell issue, conceal carry, and stand your ground. So thumbs up to her. She's she's great. I love what she's done. But this is where the NRA kind of is having problems. So Senator Flora sends a letter to uh, Marion Hammer begging for an endorsement after she publicly stated she's siding with Democrats for gun control. And she said government doesn't have the right to infringe on the Second Amendment. And the NRA still endorsed her and still backed her 2016 campaign. So why is the NRA backing a Republican that right before she begged for an endorsement, she sided with gun control Democrats to call for gun control? So who in the NRA is making those kinds of decisions? I mean, that's something I'd like to... That's, well here. that's is this the board of directors or what's going well, on? 
the board of directors is a lot like Congress, actually. You have committees and subcommittees, and then you have the Institute for Legislative Action, and then you have the NRA's Political Victory Fund. Now, the PVF, mm-hmm. they're the side that they do the endorsements. Um, so, and the way they traditionally do it is they literally send out a questionnaire to elected officials and they have the officials fill it out and they kind of do it on the honor system. It's like, Oh, okay. You filled it out. Cool. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's not good. That is and not good. <laughs> it's exactly. And I understand for a freshman candidate, you really don't have much material to go to rate them on. But when you have folks like Anna Terry Flores, who she's been in office, both in the House of Representatives here in Florida and in the Senate, and she's term limited now. So she's been a senator for eight years, and she was in the uh, the House of Representatives, I think it was for either six or eight years. So, you know, she's had a, a long time political career as a politician, and previously she had a pretty good running uh, running history. She, she backed a number of pro-gun bills in Florida. Cool. But then, as this election was kind of getting near, her true colors were being shown. Why? Yeah, she, she flipped on us, kind of like uh, Charlie Crist. Yeah, she fl- exactly like Charlie Crist. And the reason mm. why is because she was term limited and she wants to run for mayor of Miami. And Miami is a heavily Democratic uh, district to run okay. in. And her whole thing was, well, I'm going to do this because I need these votes. So she showed her true colors, which is she'll say whatever it is she needs to say. But even before then, when this legislative session was coming up, even in January, when it was still just committee meetings for bills to be pushed through and to get them onto a general floor vote, it was already known because the Miami Herald, the Jacksonville Times, the Tampa Herald, and all these different newspapers and news organizations in Florida, they already covered her and they noticed, hey, she sided with Democrats, she wants to ban this, she wants to push that. And the NRA was still like, no, 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 there's not a problem. It's all cool. Even though, yeah, she's one of the important people on the du- on the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee. No, everything's fine. Yeah, but I think, I mean, today we have completely different technology. I don't know how long these policies have been in place, but we have different technology. I don't think it takes that much for them to um, put together, you know, just a room filled with people that go online and vet stuff that's going on. And And by the way, if you're a freshman, and they don't really know how to rank you, they should just give you the lowest rank. You've got to, you know, you like have to prove, prove it. it. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it should be if you're a freshman elected official and you want the NRA's backing, you need to prove it. And by proving it as an elected official, you need to actually step up to the plate when things need to be done. And in your campaign, it just can't be, well, I support the Second Amendment, but no, it has to be, I support the Second Amendment, and I support the original founding intent of it. Right. So now, you know, I mean, I, I want to talk a little bit more about the NRA here. I mean, there's a, there's a few things that's been going on with the NRA, specifically at the, um, at the NRA convention, the annual meeting, like a few days, maybe two days before the annual meeting, they kicked out the USCCA. Yep, um, yep. I, I know exactly about that. Um, the what US- do you think about this, this whole I- thing? I think the way the NRA did it was wrong. The USCCA for a long time worked in partnership with the NRA because they were doing this whole insurance thing for concealed carry permit holders, which I think it's great. And the NRA worked with them. They allowed them to have booth space. And yes, it's the NRA's convention. They could allow who they want and who they don't. But the way they did it was pretty much a slap in the face of the USCCA. Two weeks before the actual convention, when USCCA had their booth space rented out, they were getting ready to set up everything. They just went, nope, you can't show up. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can show up as a private individual, but you can't show up as an organization. And I That's think- horrible, man. That that was like one of, that was to me, I, I really was not very happy to hear that because I mean, we, we were, we're already divided enough as it is in the gun community. And, you know, this is just throwing uh, fuel on the fire here. The, I spoke at the convention, I spoke to Jeff Knox of the Firearm Coalition, and his father, Neil Knox, was one of the uh, gentlemen that started the 1977 revolt within the NRA, which turned the NRA into the organization it is today. Because prior to that, the NRA was more focused on sports shooting and being a sports organization. For a lot of people that don't know, prior to 1977, the NRA actually wanted to move out of Washington, D.C., 
get out of gun rights altogether, be primarily a sports shooting organization, move their headquarters to Colorado and open up this multi-million dollar shooting range to host events at in New Mexico. And that was it. And Neil Knox was one of the members. And at the annual meeting in 1977 in Cincinnati, uh, he was able to uh, literally do a coup d'etat with fellow members and they overrode the board and they kept the NRA in Washington, D.C. to fight for gun rights. And when the 1980s came, there the old guard from prior to 1977 kind of got back into power and they kicked Neil Knox out. And Neil Knox had a discussion with some higher end members of the NRA and literally the argument boils down to this. It was, we are a civil rights organization. We're not a fundraising organization, which that's the constant battle going on in the NRA right now. You have one side that they look at it from a business standpoint of, hey, let's just raise money and let's keep raising money so we could fund ourselves. While the other side is, no, 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 we're a civil rights organization. We need to fight for better civil rights. If we have to spend $10 million Let's do it. That's what we're here for. That's what the membership wants. That's what we need right now. That's what we need the most right now. We need these guys out there fighting. We've all got to stick together in order to make this happen because, you know, we're we're fighting with each other on the inside and then people are fighting us from the outside. Exactly. The enemies that want to strip us of our rights, they're using divide and conquer, which is a classic military strategy. If you have the locals fight against each other for whatever perceived injustice or insult, it makes it easier for you to roll in, disarm them and take over. And it's the same thing in politics with the NRA. I think the NRA really needs to reach out more on a grassroots level, um, especially to smaller organizations. You have Pink Pistols, a fantastic organization who primarily they focus with gay gun owners and transgendered gun owners. I think that's fantastic because the NRA does have this public publicity image where most people think the NRA is a bunch of old, crusty white guys that live out in the woods. Well, look, I'm Cuban. I'm Hispanic. I'm a minority. I'm an NRA member. People, you know, people- But here's the problem is our voice, I agree with you. I'm in the category right there with you, but is our voice being heard? I mean, do we know who it is? Obviously there's been a deliberate campaign over the last few years to, to seem like, you know, they're not this old white guy, you know, but that that's a campaign that's going on on the outside. That's an outside appearance. Exactly. It's, the NRA needs it from the inside. Right. So do we know who specifically, you know, we need to deal with? Because I'm not interested in, like, getting rid of people at the NRA that are doing good things. But I'd like to identify, if I could, maybe the factions or people who are in there that are the, responsible for all these kinds of things. The way the NRA elections for the boards works is every year, 25 members are put up for vote. And you could vote for all 25 or you could vote for one. So if you fill out your ballot for all 25, your vote is diluted. But if you just vote for one or two or three candidates, that vote counts a lot more. Oh, okay. So that's something I didn't know. So if you go in there and there's a bunch of people on the list, you've got to vote for one of them. I mean, what happens if you vote for 25? What do they do with your vote? They split it up? If they they do it, they do it um, statistically and percentage wise. It's like, oh, okay. uh, um, You know, a hundred people voted for John Q and then 200 people voted for John Q and uh, Tony Fulano and 300 people voted for John Q, Tony Fulano and uh, Tom Selleck. So Mm -hmm. they, they do the math like that and then they, they do it by proportional uh, fancy mathematics. And as I always put it, space wizardry when it comes to math, because if it wasn't for a calculator, I can't do anything right. (laughs) But they have this intricate, algebraic formula which really isn't intricate but i suck okay. at math so just for anyone that wants to know i did um and lola can you verify that for me if you can look at the video because i copied the link to your petition well thank you i put that in the description of this video so anyone watching the video right now live which uh i see we've got my friend walter keller from safety harbor firearms and then we've got mark wagner zachary cahill all those people watching live. For the folks watching live, please go follow that link and then uh, f- fill out the form. Tell us what happens with this because this is not an e-form, right? 
No, no. This is a. Uh, this actually has to be printed out. It has to be signed. It has to be filled out. Uh, with the petition, you should have gotten the instruction list on how to fill it out. If, right. if you got that, uh, so you fill it out, and then it actually has to be mailed to me. So there's a PO box to mail it to. Which, if you give me one quick second, I can pull it up. Absolutely. So, well, so here's what I'm going to do. That, while I'm doing that, let me just. I could explain. So you fill out the petition, you mail it to the PO box. I then verify through NRA headquarters in uh, Fairfax, Virginia, that, hey, it's filled out properly, and then I send it to them. I have to get 653 petitions signed before October. Okay, that's, 653. That's, How many do you that, have right now? Uh, I have a couple of good folks on AR15.com in Texas and Massachusetts and in other states. They're getting petitions signed. Uh, currently in my hand, I have about, uh, six pages filled out. Uh, I don't have the number off the top of my head Okay. okay. or the better. Look, if I get 653, that's great, but I would love to send in like two, 3000. Absolutely. So what we need to do, we need to start a campaign here. I'm going to invite everyone who's watching it live. I see 904 outdoors is also watching live. I, I, um, I don't know if 904 wants to jump in here. I will, uh, if you do, let me know and I'll figure out, let, like PM me and I'll, we'll figure out a way to get you to jump in. Otherwise, I'm just going to like encourage everyone, go get that form, you know, and fill it out, mail it in. So because because you have to be a member in good standing for five years, right? Five years or if a you're lifetime. a lifetime member. So you can be a lifetime member for only a year as long as the lifetime membership is paid off. Okay, cool. So, so we need to get that going. And, and for everyone who's watching this, like after the, the live thing ends, I encourage you guys to do that. It's if you look at right here in, in Lou's lower third, he's got Lou for NRA.org. That's where you go. There's going to be instructions and all that kind of stuff. We're going to try to get him to make it easier. I did put a link specifically to the form so you can go there, but there's instructions to how to fill out the form. And all that I, kind of stuff. I, I promise you after this podcast, I will update the website. Yeah. It's just as a full-time police officer, it's kind of hard to balance yeah. a full-time job being a happily devoted husband to a wonderful, fantastic wife who, if it wasn't for her, I can't, I wouldn't do this because she is literally my inspiration and my biggest supporter. And all right. Awesome. Also balancing this campaign of course right awesome shout out to mrs valdez out there <laughs> you know she, behind she's, behind she's, every good, good man is a strong woman <laughs> no no no. in reality behind every man is the woman pulling the strings <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I, yeah i, have, I know I have about that say, i have to say in every i have the final say in every argument yes dear yeah <laughs> good one yeah so listen i know it is busy for you you're you're doing stuff you're working right now you've got a lot of things going on so i invite everyone out there you know you know help lou out let's help make this happen there's things that we can do you can fill out the form send it in you know you can share um his stuff on social media if you're a youtuber then get out there and um get in touch with him and do some kind of interview like this and help him get the message out because we've got until October. What did you say? It's uh, I don't have the documentation in front of me, but right. I believe it's October 1st. But I could tell you this. I'm trying to push it for September. Uh, the mailing address is P.O. Box 18072 Tallahassee, Florida 32318. My website, once again, is Lou, the number four, NRA.org. So that's L O U, the number four, NRA.org. And if you want to email me, it's Lou, the number four, NRA at gmx.com. Okay, great. I, so, uh, I'll try to post all that info in the description as well, as much as I can. I am 100% open to answering questions of viewers and supporters and NRA members and even uh, potential NRA members because. The NRA is, like I said, it's the 800-pound gorilla in the room, and there's about five to six million members nationwide, and yet we're a country of 300 million. And it's estimated that more than 60% of the population are gun owners. We need to increase NRA numbers first and foremost because that's what really gives it strength is the membership. Second is the board of directors. The membership – voices their concerns through the board of directors. This past election cycle with the NRA, they completely changed the election process to literally do a power grab and keep the old guard in. So you think this was deliberate? 
Oh, it was completely deliberate because it used yeah. to be you only needed 250 petition signatures. Now they're doing it proportional to how many people vote per the election cycle. This past year, they drew the magic number of 653. Next okay. year, who knows what it's going to be and who knows what they're going to change. But they pushed a lot of things through. And it was really kind of underhanded. And like I said, I've been a member since 94. And it hurts me to see an organization do this. It's not right. Yeah, but obviously there, you know, there's some concern here on their part that they're losing their their grip on it. So, you know, the the quickest way to deal with that is is by changing the rules. So, how many how many um, board seats or I don't know what how you uh, there, there's there's it. Sem- there's 76 seats total every election cycle, which is every year. 25 are up for election. So, out of that. Th- the you have 75 seats and they run for a three-year term of office the 76 seat is for a one-year term of office and they're kind of like the uh the the speaker of the house per se they're they're the they're the type it's a transitionary kind of um, it's exactly it's it's the transitionary seat so they're there that seat is up for election every year and the voting for that seat actually happens at the nra meeting and that could be done by every NRA member. If you paid for a one-year membership and you've only been a member for a week, you could still vote. Okay, so uh, what seat now? So you're just running for a regular I'm, seat. I'm running for a regular three-year term uh, between myself and Adam Kraut and uh, Tim Knight and a couple other folks. We're going to have a discussion on who's going to run for the 76 seat if, sadly, not all of us win our elections. And if it comes to it, I will gladly back whoever it is if I am not that person. Because I'm not going to stop fighting for the Second Amendment whether I get on the board or not. I'm going to do it as a private individual. Uh, If I have to, I will form my own organization here in Florida for Florida gun owners. And if it expands, it would be fantastic. If it doesn't, I understand, but I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop because to me, it's it's a civil rights issue. It's an issue that affects men, women, people of color. Uh, It's gun ownership. Isn't just about, you know, straight white old guys. Uh, I have a very good friend in San Francisco who is a transgendered shooter and what's hilarious is if you look at her, you wouldn't think she is a constitutionalist conservative gun owner living in San Francisco. And yet right. she is. Guns so, are for everyone. You know, it's not just it the bad guys. It's not just the, you know, the good guys in terms of the cops out there. It's not just for the special people in government who need to be protected. It's for all of us. It is. It's for all of us. It's for you. It's for me. It's for everyone. And right now, we really do have to focus on the fight for the future generations, because I guarantee you it took a hundred years for them to strip us of our rights to where we are. It's going to take a hundred years for us to regain it. And we're going to have to do it one piece at a time. And we need to start now. We don't need to start tomorrow. We don't need to start next week. We don't need to start next. We need to start now. We need to hold our elected representatives feet to the fire. If they campaign as a pro gun candidate, call them, email them, write them, go to their district office, go to their physical office in the Capitol, whether it's on the state or federal level, hell, go to city hall, go to the county hall. You have gun control advocates on every level of government. We need to step up to the game, to the plate and push back. This is no longer just sit and wait and let someone else do the fighting because that's how I was until I got off my butt. And now I'm trying to do something, whether I run for the board and I get on or I don't, I'm not going to stop fighting. I will. Yeah, I think you also have to, you also have to make sure that you're watching the watchers. You know, if, if, if we're out there thinking, Hey, you know, the NRA has this covered or this group or this politician has it covered and everything's going to be okay there. They're looking out for me. You know, the thing you have to remember is that when people get comfortable and complacent and they've got, because we're, we're sending them a lot of money. You know, you've got record numbers of people buying guns. Gun ownership is is going up, and we are sending the money because you know I don't think every new gun owner gets into the NRA. But no, no, it, right. it, it doesn't. I mean, 
in New York alone, this past May, they had, uh, according to the FBI's uh, National Instant Criminal Check System, the you know the background system, they had record sales in New York, where it is right. extremely oppressive to get a permit. Yeah, so York, I, I, my, my brother actually just got a permit, believe it or not. And he's, well, he's a resident of New York City. <laughs> but this is, not, have, this is not a concealed permit. This is just to it's own. Just a perm it's a permit to own. I have, yeah. uh, I have family in Puerto Rico, and in 2016, they actually had constitutional carry for just about 10 months. And then the uh, higher courts there ruled that, nope, the uh, permitting system's fine. You're back to a May issue permit. But in Puerto Rico, they're – there's been a 53% increase in permit applications. And you know who it is? Women. 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 Okay, so you know what? I mean, I know this is a little bit like off topic here, but let's talk about Puerto Rico. Um, have you ever been there? Uh, you said you've got family there. Uh, I have been there many, many years ago, and I vaguely remember it because okay. I was a kid. <laughs> so, you but, know, like right now, Puerto Rico just voted. I don't know. I, I don't think it was a high number of people in Puerto Rico 20, voted. 23% of the eligible voters voted for statehood. So out of, right. out of the entire population, only 23% voted. And out of that 23%, 97% of them voted for statehood. Right. So what do you think's going on here? And, you know... What are your feelings on it? On a personal level, I believe that Puerto Rico should be granted statehood along with the U.S. Virgin Islands and American Samoa, which actually American Samoa is a completely issue, different issue. I think they should be afforded uh, U.S. citizenship because they have the highest rate of enlistment out of everywhere in the United States. But they're not even U.S. citizens. They're just U.S. nationals. Well, that's mm. a whole other topic. But do mm. I think Puerto Rico should be granted statehood? Yes, but they need to get their house in order. Financially, they are a complete mess. Politically, they are – the best way I could put it is unstable because they're kind of bipolar. They go back and forth between the uh, uh, the PDP and the NPP, which are the two political parties in Puerto Rico. And for those that don't know, the – PDP is the Democrats if the Democrats were basically open socialists and the NPP are kind of like blue dog Democrats here in the States. They're their Republican Party. Okay. <laughs> so right. Puerto Rico on a political side kind of is more on the left leftist side. So – And it's kind of a situation that they've gotten themselves into huge financial difficulties and it's kind of an easy solution. Oh, you know what? I'm broke. Let me see if I can get someone to adopt me. We do we do things for Puerto Rico already and people who live in Puerto Rico are free to come back and forward and all that. Well, I don't think they can vote. Well, what a lot right. of people don't realize is the – the political situation in Puerto Rico is this. A lot of people say, oh, well, they're U.S. citizens, but they don't pay taxes and they mooch off welfare. That's not entirely the case. Uh, for the first 50 years of U.S. governance, Puerto Rico didn't even have home rule. They couldn't elect any official. So Congress ruled them directly. And then slowly but surely, they started getting home rule and they could elect local representatives and then they could elect a governor and they could set up their own government and so on and so forth. But Congress still kind of controls what goes on in Puerto Rico. And they've done these special tax exemptions for corporate businesses, businesses that are too big to fail, mind you. Uh, and when these tax exemptions are twisted or ended, uh, these businesses suddenly pull out of Puerto Rico and they go to overseas markets instead, and the economy kind of spirals out of control. Now, the Puerto Rican government did get drunk with power when they did have tax, benef uh, tax uh, profits coming in from local corporate taxation on these businesses, and they spent it on a bunch of stupid stuff. I'm not going to deny it. But the actual situation in Puerto Rico is more multifaceted. You have a lot of big business lobbying there to keep certain uh, tax exemptions in place, while at the same time, the actual Puerto Ricans, which are U.S. citizens, mind you, living on the island, they don't pay into uh, the federal um, insurance. You know, um, I, I'm having a brain fart here. I can't remember the technical term, but... Uh, uh, payroll, federal payroll mm -hmm. insurance, but they do pay into Social Security, into FICA, into other things, and at the same time, the Puerto Rican government heavily taxes their income. Okay, so, so it's a really weird situation, yeah, and, it, and it's not it, going to be easy to unravel. It, it's not going to be. The reason why they're applying for statehood is because a U.S. state is allowed bankruptcy protection. 
that by law, Puerto Rico is not. That's the only, that's the big difference between Puerto Rico as a territory versus being a state. Other, and the other big thing is, for those that don't know, in the early 18, in the late 1890s and early 1900s, there was a series of Supreme Court cases grouped together called the Insular Cases, which literally said the flag, the Constitution doesn't follow the flag. So technically, to this day, the Bill of Rights doesn't apply directly to Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, and American Samoa and the Northern Marianas Islands. So the Second Amendment doesn't apply to them. The First Amendment doesn't apply to them. The Fourth Amendment, you know, the right to be secure in your persons doesn't apply for them. The Fifth Amendment, the right not to self-incriminate doesn't apply to them fully. And that's because of this horrible Supreme Court case. Okay. In the early 1900s, which, you know, if you go back to Good old days. Well, it's because they're dark-skinned people or they're Catholics or they're Latino, and it was pushed for a lot of horrible, horrible reasons. But Puerto Rico is broken in a lot of areas that needs to get fixed up. Half of it is on their end. Half of it is on the federal government's end. But ultimately, would I like to see Puerto Rico as a state? Yes, I would, if they get their house in order. Right. Okay. Cool. So let me let me just uh, pull up a question here. You know, we're gonna we're gonna pivot back, <laughs> back around. So I've got a question from Mark Wagner. He says, or a comment. He says, NRA is viewed by lots of folks suspiciously. Many would prefer to see more education, safety, and hunting. I kind of get where he's going with that because I know the NRA has the uh, Eddie Eagle program, which is to educate kids in schools, but that's mm -hmm. a voluntary program on the school part, if they want to allow that in or not. And that's kind of the, and I, I don't want to misconstrue what he's asking. So I don't know if he's saying, is the NRA kind of more like a FUD organization? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think, I think part of it, he's saying people view it suspiciously. You know, and then he's saying he thinks uh, most people would prefer or, he, you know, in his opinion, people would prefer to see more, you know, ed education, safety and hunting. That's his comment that he's making. And I know that you're you're saying that that you view it as a civil rights organization and well, you'd like to see them doing more of that, which I think I agree with. Well, with, as a civil rights organization, education actually is paramount and important to it. Mm -hmm. You can't have a society and a community that could exercise their rights if they don't know about it. And education mm -hmm. does play a part. Uh, that's why I kind of want the NRA to get more involved in the grassroots efforts. Like you have the, Af the Appleseed Project, which teaches basic marksmanship and firearm safety, and they tie it in to the colonial history of America and the Battle of Lexington and Concord, you know, the infamous shot her around the world that started the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. The NRA should kind of reach out into that. Okay. The NRA should reach out into more of the local community aspects. And yeah, the NRA does, but I think they really need to shift their funds around to more grassroots efforts on both the political side and the outreach side. The NRA, if they continue down their current path, they're going to decrease in membership because more and more people are going to view them suspiciously. And on top of that, people just aren't going to care because the demographics of gun owners mindset is changing. Gun ownership in the fifties and sixties and seventies was more sport oriented for hunting and target shooting. Now the primary reason for gun ownership is self-defense. And the NRA really needs to step up the game on that and reach. Yeah, we, I think a lot of us see them as that they, they should be out there lobbying for us, you know, um, you know, keeping the pressure on the people in Congress, etc. So we funnel our money in their direction when we're worried that we're going to lose our rights. We we send these guys a lot of money, and uh, you know that's that's been doing okay. But then you see that when you when people start getting a lot of money and and they have that power, then they start getting drunk off of it. And, and they start to do things like what we've seen recently, I mean, not just like at the last convention, but over the last few years that they're really trying to, trying really hard to control this situation and they are pushing a lot of people away. It, exactly. You, you know, the old saying, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Here in right. Florida, and you know, I respect Marion Hammer for what she's done. She's been fighting since the late 70s. 
But the latest victory here in Florida that the NRA touted was, hey, we lowered your NRA, your CCW fees in Florida, and it amounts to a seventy-one cent saving per year. For free. <laughs> seventy-one cents. Yeah, I, what can you buy right. in Florida for seventy-one cents? I don't, I don't know. Look, I don't even know if I could go to a vending machine and get a soda for seven for no, seven think so. cents, let alone seventy-one cents. No. But I mean. For example, you had. You, I don't think you can't buy a bag of peanuts. <laughs> Those no, no. bags of peanuts on the side of the road. They're a buck. Yeah, yeah you yeah. drive. You know, you drive. Yeah. <laughs> buck. But you, for example, you know, you had Senator Greg Stubbe, great guy. He was the one that uh, uh, authored the open carry and campus carry bill here in Florida, and the NRA really didn't tackle that. They were just more like, eh, if it passes, it passes. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, we're not yeah. worried about Anna Terry Flores, and we're not worried about this. It's just. Whatever. Yeah, I think this is what Mark. Here's Mark. Uh, you know, clarifying his comments, he says that he thinks they should keep with the civil rights side, but not become just a lobbying group. You know, so I, I, I think I people don't like, like that idea of a lobbying group. You know, I think that's what happened with uh, Springfield Armory and Rock River Arms. That you know, they they feel like, well, oh, these lobbyists could be out there negotiating things that maybe are good for them, but not good for us. Well, that's see the difference is with Springfield Armory. They had their own, it was just them and Rock River and their own private lobbyist. The NRA has 5 million members. If the membership, if Mark is actively involved with the NRA as a member and calls the NRA and asks to speak to, to the member, you know, to the board of directors and actually calls people and says, look, as a member, I want to know what's going on. Then in the, then the NRA will fight and the NRA will fight on their, on your behalf. Yeah. Part of the problem is is apathy amongst the membership because they just get the mail, you know, the magazine or the yeah. email, and they go, "Oh, everything's hunky dory and it's cool." Yeah, it it it's a it's a double sided issue. The NRA itself, as an organization, is falling in the wayside and is having problems, but the membership too can expect results if they don't hold the NRA's feet to the fire, and part of that is the board of directors. I love, you know, we, there's some famous names on it. Tom Selleck, great guy, very pro second amendment. You have Ted Nugent, you have, uh, you know, everyone's favorite actor, the gunny, Arlie Ermey. And I love these guys. And yes, they are a public face to the organization, but in the grand scheme of things, have you really seen Tom Selleck or Ted Nugent or Arlie Ermey? go to Congress or go to a state Capitol or go to a protest or a March and really fight for the, NR for the second amendment. Yeah. I'm not sure what they've done, what they've done lately. And that's why I'm trying to find out like who's actually at the wheel here. You know, you've got these 75, 76 guys, but who's actually at the wheel, like who's brainchild or all these things. Because if you look at this um, uh, concealed carry insurance that the NRA came out with, Mm -hmm. They kicked the um, USCCA out uh, at the last minute, but there's no way that they thought that up at the last minute because they had hats and all kinds of. Oh yeah, yeah. Ready, there's, so. there's, there, there's no way. And with that, that's where, like I said, it's kind of like government itself. How you have all these little subcommittees and committee chairmans, and you have the other thing with the NRA too is with the board of directors is you actually have members that really don't show up to committee meetings. Well, that's and 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 I've got I've got a question on that, which is which is which is uh, fortuitous. Um, I think it's Lug One, right, Lola? Is that the person? Okay, he says, "What are your thoughts on ousting NRA board members who don't show up to meetings?" Oh, I completely agree. If you're gonna, for people that don't know, you don't get paid as an NRA board member. The only okay. thing you are is you're compensated for an NRA event. So if I had to fly out to uh, Fairfax, Virginia for a meeting, the NRA will compensate me for that. And that's it. I don't get paid as a, as an NRA board member. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get a penny for it. So you have people that they get on the board and then they just kind of like, Dah! you know, it's, I'm busy. I can't do that. I got other things to deal with. Look, I think they should be ousted. I burn my own vacation time to lobby for better gun rights as a private citizen. I have no problem burning vacation time to go to an NRA meeting. I have no problem doing that because I'm passionate about this. And I think yeah, you, you're, a, you're a gun nerd. I mean, you know, you're not just uh, this is not just some cool kind of thing. You're not trying to win prom king or anything here. No, you no. really care about this. I was reading your bio. I mean, you've you've been interested in this and been doing this for a long time. 
it's for me it's really simple the the second amendment is just one part of freedom and i love freedom in general i love the first amendment i love being able to express myself i love the ability to owning a firearm i love the ability to start my own business and travel and uh, practice my own religion and marry whoever I want to marry and so on and so forth. But when it comes to the second amendment, it's one of the few acts that is literally a physical, tangible thing you could do exercising a constitutional right. Speaking is metaphorical. Being secure in your person and papers and homes from unlawful search and seizure is metaphorical. Literally going to a gun store, buying a Glock, taking it to the range and shooting it and then having it for self-protection is physical. It is one of the few things that is tangible. When I literally hold this Glock in my hand, I'm holding the second amendment in my hand. I am literally wielding freedom and liberty here. Right. And people from all across the world want that. As a guy growing up in Miami, I've seen plenty of immigrants from Cuba, from Venezuela, from Argentina, from the Dominican Republic, from Europe, from China, when they're not even U.S. citizens yet. They're just here as, you know, resident aliens, and they've jumped through all the hoops. They have their green card. They've gone to lose gun shop in Hialeah, and they've slapped their green card and their proof of residency, and they buy their gun, and they do it with a smile because every time they do it, they always, when I've heard as a guy that used to work there, I can't do this in my old country. I couldn't do this in China. I couldn't do this in Cuba. I couldn't do this in the Dominican Republic. I couldn't do this in Belgium or France or Luxembourg or Algeria or Kenya. You know, they do it here because it's one of the few things that literally it's freedom. It's literal freedom in their hands. So yeah, ousting guys from the NRA that don't do their job. Definitely. Uh, Tim Knight, I love him. He's on the. He's a current board member who's running for re-election, and instead of running by nomination of the board, he's running by the peti by petition because, as he puts it, if NRA members don't like him, they won't sign his petition. They won't, you know, if they don't like what he's doing, right. they'll tell him by not signing his petition, right. and that's honorable. And he's taking the high road by doing that because he could just get on the ballot by the board's recommendation, but no, he doesn't. He's the role model, and he. Uh, for those that don't know, he's the one that started the whole recall effort in Colorado after Governor Hickenlooper did sign that uh, magazine ban and assault weapons ban in Colorado and got the uh, Senate president and a couple other people recalled. He's okay. the guy that started that. He's one of the role models that told me, you know what? You should run. You, you should get off your butt and you should do this. Right. And when I listened to him, I was like, what are you crazy? I'm, I'm not this rich guy. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a lawyer. You know, I'm, I'm just a, I'm a cop, man. All I do is I make like 40 grand a year and I pay a mortgage and, you know, I try to keep the wife happy. And he's like, that's why you should run. Absolutely. I, I think I agree with him on that, you know, and uh, th those, you're the kind of guys that we need in there. Now here's a lug one that has a follow up to that. He said that Ted Nugent gets special compensation Maybe not the other members. Uh, are you aware of that? Do you know whether or not that's the, true? The last, the last financial records that came out from the NRA was that Ted Nugent was paid fifty thousand dollars to show up to an NRA event. Now, I would think as a board member, if you're passionate about the Second Amendment, you should just show up. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I understand Ted. Look, I, I, I'm not faulting the man for he has his. TV show and he has his concerts and he has his business and he's a big time personality. Yeah, but there's lots of things he could do without yeah. being a, bo a board member. If that, if the position of board member is so important that we have to pay you to show up there, you know, I get it. I mean, it, he may have costs and things like that, but he also may be in a position to pay for that versus other guys like yourself who are on there. And because you're not special, you don't necessarily get that. And that same thing could go for guys like Arlie Ermey, because I know that he, it, you know, he's doing things at these, I don't know whether or not he gets paid. I haven't seen these uh, financial reports you're talking about, but maybe there's some people on there that there's kind of like a quid pro quo thing going on. Um, you know, I, I can't tell, I can't say about everyone. I know in the Gunny's case, Great, great guy. I've met him a couple of times. He actually strangled me, and I have the picture of it. Okay. It's awesome. <laughs> he but, is a nice um, guy. He, he's a real nice guy. But, mm -hmm. I mean, I know on 
a business side, I know he's a spokesperson for Glock and I know Glock pays him very well. And I'm not denying that, you know, Hey, mm -hmm. you know, this is America. If you have the ability to make money and as right. a businessman, do it, yeah. we're not against but, that at all. Yeah. But to then like in Ted Nugent's case, to have the NRA pay you $50,000 to go to a function or an event when you're a board member, that's kind of, you know, it's kind of a slap in the face of the membership saying, well, why are we paying you this when you're a board member, when you're supposed to be one of the guys who's our voice? Right. So, um, so how did this come to light? Um, every year the NRA has to release their financial statements. And if I recall, it was guns.com that they got first a hold of it and they posted the information and at the actual NRA meeting, they also passed out the uh, financial statements for 2016 and I got my hands on it and I reviewed it and I was able to confirm it. And I was going, yep. Okay. So did you, and you don't recall right now seeing anyone else getting that kind of special treatment? Um, I know that in Marion Hammer's case, she was paid $256,000 for her lobbying efforts. Um, she also, for this is for Florida specific, mm -hmm. she also runs the NRA affiliate organization in Florida called the Unified Sportsmen's of Florida, which uh, they're a state level chapter. So she's both the uh, lobbyist for that and the lobbyist for the NRA here in Florida. Right. But she got so, paid 256,000. Wow. Okay. So we just had someone join in 904 Outdoors. Also a Floridian, you a YouTuber. What's up, man? Just introduce yourself real quick to the folks out there. Uh, hey, I'm Steven from 904 Outdoors. Uh, we're a Pro 2A uh, YouTube channel. Uh, we do all kinds of cool stuff. We blow stuff up, and and we love the NRA. Awesome. Oh, are you, you have are you, to have blowing stuff up. I got to go now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, do you know about Lewis? I do, yes. Uh, actually, I've, I've uh, seen a lot of stuff about him on uh, Facebook and everything. So. Right, well, yes. Thank you. So what, I, what I'd like to do is make sure that, you know, we all get together and try to do something and push this effort. He's a Floridian, you know, and he, he's, you know, he's one of us. We want to make sure we get him on there. So if you've got anything to add to the conversation, man, feel free to jump in. I, I know you've been watching it from the outside. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've been watching it. Uh, actually, <laughs> I drove all the way home from work listening to you guys uh, ever since it started. So it's, it's been a pretty good conversation so far. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, to get back to what I was talking about, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm concerned about that. Obviously, we're all giving, we're all paying up dues to the NRA. And I know some people need to get paid. I mean, the, the reality, the reality of it is, is, you know, not every job here can be done for free and there's expenses. I mean, even with Ted Nugent, you know, to come out, he's got to fly out there. But yeah. that doesn't mean that we have to pay for first class and put him up in, you know, the presidential suite. Not, not, no organization runs off unicorn farts and wishes. I mean, the NRA is a operating organization. It has expenses. Uh, things are not cheap. You know, to fight for gun rights, it isn't cheap. You have to spend money on lobbyists. You have to spend money on court cases and lawyers and advertising and all that. And I get it. I'm not, I'm not going after the NRA in that because. I'm an NRA member. I want to make the NRA better and stronger and louder and faster. And I want to get the 800 pound gorilla out of its cage. And I want it to get all roided up and high on juice. And I want it to just be that really scary organization that the anti-gun folks are terrified of. Absolutely. I, I agree with you, man. I think we need to like ramp up the pressure because we're right now at a really, really weird time in history that we could be looking back on this 20 years from now and going, wow, what happened? You know, how do we lose all these freedoms? I mean, it's, it's a precarious situation. We, we are, we have gone on this wonderful up climb, regaining freedoms since the 1980s with the passage of the concealed carry movement and now constitutional carry and open carry. But we are literally one stone throws away from losing it all one election and it could all be gone. And yes, the Democrats had control uh, in, you know, under Obama for a short period of time in Congress, and they wasted their political capital on Obamacare, which a lot of people say, oh, well, it doesn't apply to the Second Amendment. But here's the thing. That's one seventh of the U.S. economy. They got control of that. Now they could focus their energy on gun control, and they're not doing it on the federal level. They're doing it on the state level. They're going through all the state houses and they're passing what they want to do on a national level through the states. If all 50 states pass universal background checks, guess what? 
so so what? It wasn't passed on a federal level. All fifty states still have it. Yeah, it's still de facto law of the of yeah. the land of, of the land. If yeah. they want, if they pass an assault weapons ban or a magazine ban or rest, or pass more gun free zones through all fifty states, it's the de facto law. They're they're changing their tactics to go to attack us through the state level, and we are kind of failing on that. You have Colorado fell, you have Oregon and Washington are falling, you have, of course, the SAFE Act in New York, God, God, I hate the SAFE Act. Um, you have what happened in Massachusetts with the Attorney General, where literally she pulled the rules out of her butt and said, hey, you know, that assault weapons ban that uh, Mitt Romney signed into law? Yeah, Mitt Romney, a Republican, signed that into law. Yeah, that mirrors the 94 Clinton ban. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to reinterpret Let's it. Let's do all that. Those, <laughs> and all those guns that, were, that used to be legal as post-ban configured rifles are now illegal. And, and you know, and, and if you look at it, no Connecticut, has- Connecticut is in so much trouble. I mean, uh, you know, you really wouldn't think so. But if you look co- close at Connecticut, there's a lot of uh, weird things going on there. If you look at the, uh, the financial troubles that they're in and then the industry, specifically the gun industry, is dying or being killed off in Connecticut. Oh, it happened in Maryland. I mean, Maryland passed their assault weapons ban, and Breda basically said, you know what? Screw you. We're moving to Tennessee, and they did. And in New York, it's happening too. Remington was on was in Illinois, New York forever, and they're, they're still going to be there corporate-wise mm-hmm. because, you know, that that is their corporate headquarters. But they're moving production to um, uh, Alabama, and why? Because Alabama is a pro-gun state. New York yeah. isn't. Yeah. So uh, let me just give a comment here. And then uh, 904, I'd like you to to uh, comment on this, you know, as well as Lewis, obviously. So Chris Bogan says, now we have a pro Second Amendment president. Do you guys agree, disagree with that? And what do you think, you know, Trump should be doing uh, for us? Or what have you seen him doing? Go ahead, 904, you hit that. I think, yeah, I think he's pro Second Amendment. Um, to me, it seems to be like he's he's taking one step at a time building just you know building his way up and uh everything that he tries to push uh keeps getting knocked down by the, the democrats so i mean it's it's kind of difficult for uh for him to push everything that he's wanting um the first things i heard was he was trying to repeal the nfa act at one point which would be really nice <laughs> yeah the hearing that protection would act would be really nice <laughs> the hearing protection act would be really nice to go through also but um i don't know time will tell uh, supposedly he's supposed to be uh, pro 2A, so it's a, uh, he's way more pro 2A than Hillary is, so that's a good thing. <laughs> right. What do you think, I, Lou? Uh, I definitely know he's pro 2A. In 2014, he actually uh, publicly spoke out against the SAFE Act uh, at one of the uh, the rallies in New York, and a lot of people don't know it because it's kept on the down low, especially by a number of, I, I can't name names, but the media, of course, will not promote that. You know, NBC, ABC, the mainstream media, all these guys, they won't promote that. Hey, the president actually is really pro gun to the point that he spoke <laughs> at a public rally rallying against the SAFE Act. Yeah, they're not going to say that. Um, he's a concealed carry permit holder in New York City. He's one of the lucky few that actually yep, has one. The very lucky few. I wish New York was shell issue. Actually, I wish New York was constitutional carry. Everybody but, should uh, be. Yeah, everyone should be. But... I, the biggest challenge he's facing is Congress, and it's not just the Democrats. It's actually a lot of it is the Republican Party. Um, last year, when the rumor mill was that the civilian marksmanship program might be getting 1911s to sell, like how they sell nine, nine, uh, M1 Grands, John McCain, our former candidate for president, uh, tried to kill that via amendment because in his mindset, nope. 1911 shouldn't go to the public. Screw them. So you you actually have Republicans that are anti-gun. Um, I think a lot of them. I think you know what I remember when John McCain was running, and uh, you know he was running against Obama, and a lot of people said, you know what, one of the reasons why he shouldn't be president is because he's not even going to live out through, you know, <laughs> so live long enough to serve his uh, his term. And obviously, he lived out through you know all the years that Obama was president, and he's still out there. The thing is, is like you know, I wonder sometimes if uh, you know some brain cells have died. <laughs> Because it's it's almost like he's you know I'm not saying he wasn't he didn't have some of these tendencies before but he's really flipped lately. 
Well, I, I don't think that he's flipped. I just think that his true colors are coming out. I mean, if we go through historically, George Pataki, governor of New York in the 90s, he signed New York's assault weapons ban into law. Mitt Romney, Republican, 2000, he signed Massachusetts' assault weapons ban into law. Ronald Reagan, the demigod of conservatism, as governor in New York, in, I'm sorry, not New York, in California, in 1967, outlawed open carry and pushed for the 10 day waiting period in California. Right. Uh, Schwarzenegger, when he was governor in New York, he said, uh, once I keep saying New York, California, said, California, California, California no, I know. hold on, not California. California. <laughs> governor, <laughs> California. Yeah. He signed the 50 caliber ban in California. Mm. Um, the, in 1989, Republican governor again in California signed the uh, assault weapons ban in over there. So you've had a repeated history of certain Republican candidates and politicians push for gun control. Yeah. And I think, you know, here's the thing. Like we, we just got a comment that we haven't seen anything from Trump yet. And, um, I, you know, I'm going to let you guys comment, comment on that in a second here. You know what? I think that's true. I think um, I, I support the president. I voted for him. You know, I, it was important to me to to have some kind of control over who goes into the Supreme Court. Obviously, the NRA, um, you know, got heavy behind him. I don't remember when they had, you know, when they had discussions about this with the members of the NRA, but they made up their mind. They did that. He came out to the NRA before the election. He came to the NRA after the election. He was at the last convention. I saw his son walking around. I actually saw him. I had some video of um, of uh, Eric. Was it Eric Trump or yeah? I think it's Eric Trump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was. It was yeah. Eric Trump. Yeah, I have some video of him talking to Colin Noir at the convention. I was gonna like put my own voice in there, make up voices, and put it up. I can't really hear what they're talking about, so I was just gonna make it up. <laughs> um, you know, so they did all of that. But the truth of the matter is we really haven't seen anything here and we do have a majority right now. And the further that we go down this path, I think the, the more uh, dangerous it becomes. And that's the thing that people should worry about who think that they're just going to drop suppressors off the NFA and all that kind of stuff. If we don't get those things soon, we probably, you know, we're, we're less and less likely to get them. What do you think about that, uh, Stephen? Uh as far as Trump being pro 2A, I thought it was a huge thing that he actually went to the, the NRA convention. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, I think they said he was the first president to do that since Reagan. Uh, yeah, probably. Right, and, right, Lou? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so, but okay, it was great that he goes, but what I'm saying is like, you know, like how long do we wait for something to happen before we do something about it? And if we wait until we have the next elections, you know, even if he says like, well, in this last term, I'm going to do something about it. What, what are the likelihoods, especially if we get a shift in, um, you know, in Congress? My my battery is dying. So okay. I'm, I'm going to try to answer this one quick. The pr The way the system works is the president is just one man. He has Congress to deal with. Congress writes the laws. Congress passes the laws. He signs them into law. The NRA really needs to put the legislative pressure on our legislators and our, the NRA members and gun owners as a whole right now, if you're an NRA member, fantastic. If you're not join the NRA, but even if you're not going to, I'd rather you would, but step up to the plate as a private citizen, call your elected members and put their feet to the fire. That's the only way it's going to happen. He could, the president could make all the promises he want, but we live in a constitutional republic, and if it's a constitutional republic if we could keep it. And the prior president, through edicts and administrative actions and executive orders and executive si signatures, tried to bypass Congress. We're not that country, and President Trump will not do that, or at least I hope he won't, because if he does, then that'll be a major – you'll drop a major level in my view. But we need to put pressure on Congress, and we need to put pressure on the state-level legislative houses, and we need to put pressure on city halls and county commissions to push, to one, repeal anti-gun laws. So and enough of the gun-free zones. They don't work. People get targeted. People get attacked. They don't keep people safe. We need to push for more liberalized carry laws. 
That means constitutional carry. That means shall issue permits. That means allowing the private citizen to be able to defend themselves. Because as a police officer, when minutes count, when seconds count, I'm minutes behind. I'm minutes away. And I say this with reality. If I could be there in an instant to keep people safe, I would be. But sadly, the laws of physics and time don't allow me to do that. When you need that crucial moment to defend yourself, you should have the right to do that. And the NRA needs to step up to the plate on that. And that's why I said it's a civil rights. And I know people are asking about, is it going to be a civil rights issue and lobbyists and, and it should be focused more on education. And I get that. But the core of this is, is civil rights, nothing more, nothing less. And that involves freedom. That's where I'm at. That's what I'm about. Absolutely. Well said, man. I, I, I 100% agree with you. If we lose this, if we lose this battle now, then we lose it forever. So we have to keep up the pressure on everyone. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, Steven, do you have do you have something that you want to add? You know, lose batteries dying. We've been doing this for a little <laughs> over an hour. We should probably wrap it up. Do you have something also, you want to add before I close? Also, the wife is getting hungry. Yeah. <laughs> do not let the wife starve. That is not no. a good move. <laughs> yeah, that's not a good thing. Yeah. Um, thank you, Hank, for uh, letting me uh, come on the show. Try to watch as many of these as possible. And uh, kind of your channel has been a, a kind of a role model for our channel. So we, you know, kind of kind of copied off you in a lot of ways. <laughs> Just uh, awesome. thanks for letting me come on. Awesome. Thanks, man. We'll definitely have you on again. You know, once we get this established, we're going to be doing this every day. So I just want to invite people, everyone out there to watch. We're going to do this every day. We've done this twice today. This is the second live thing that we've done. And before we go, so that, you know, Mrs. Valdez can get some food. Yep. yep. So that Lou's, you know, Lou's not li living in a doghouse. I want to remind people again to look up Luis Valdez. You can you can search Google Luis Valdez NRA, and you're going to see a bunch of things about him. Follow him. We all need to. I'm going to make sure I download that form. I'm going to do it. Lola's going to do it. I encourage you to do it. 904 Outdoors. Everyone oh, yeah. watching, share it with everyone out there. Let's get this going, <laughs> and we will have Lou back, and we'll have this conversation again. So Definitely. Right. Now, just stick there, guys. I'm going to end the live broadcast, but you guys stick there for a few seconds. All nice. right, folks. Can I do a quick shout out? Absolutely. Just as a quick shout out to all the guys on AR15.com, 40 Smith & Wesson is the best caliber. I don't care what you all say. <laughs> Wait. Oh, man. I agree. I agree. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. I'm going to let you get that one. I'm not going to come down on you since we got to go. All right. Stick right there. All right, guys. I'm ending this. Thanks for watching. We appreciate the support here. I'm Hank Strange. And to support us, we are Patreon slash Hank Strange. Peace out.